Hello there, and welcome back to the Agassi Nilzinga Show with me, your host, Agassi Nilzinga, and this is episode number 413, that's 413 of the Agassi Nilzinga Show with me, your host, Agassi Nilzinga. How's it going? How are you feeling? Great, amazing. How am I? Doing the best I can with the time that's allotted to me. <laughs> if it's the first time checking out the show, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and of course, turn your notification bell. That'll be a make sure that you get notif- notified as to when I put out new videos. I put them out what every other day or so, more than five per day. So make sure you do that so you can keep abreast of all the developments on this little channel of mine. And of course, if you're what, listening, listening more importantly via the podcast app whether it's on apple on spotify wherever it may be make sure you download the show share it with all your family and friends and of course leave me a five-star review and if you want to support the show via patreon you're more than welcome to it's patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o to get access to my entire library as well as one bonus episode for post for patreon members only so make sure you sign up on patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o for more info so here we are hope you guys are well hope you guys are doing good wherever you are situated and life is not um hit you like a ton of bricks like it has others i think we're all sort of you know going through our uh, um peaks and valleys when it comes to dealing with covid and how we've kind of maneuvered around the home maneuvered around jobs family friends loved ones whatever it may be it's been a bit of a difficult situation to kind of come to grips with but i would hope for the most part a lot of people have sort of realized and or come to the realization or accepted you know life will never life won't be the same for a, a prolonged period of time but we can make some you know we can make the best of it for the moment that we have on this godforsaken planet <laughs> that's why i say especially with the recent developments you know the uk in the uk sorry considering covid and how we've basically dealt with it or not dealt with it um there is um there is a thinking or there is a, a position of pessimism that you could adopt here that would be somewhat warranted no one's ever gonna say you're being too negative if you're like oh this is gonna take years to recover from because whenever we have an opportunity to do something different whenever we see some light at the end of the tunnel especially in the uk right we just got we're the first country in europe to approve a vaccine but still there's like a dark cloud hanging over us there's no real route out of this and it feels like every day is like groundhog day in that regard right that's the odd thing especially when it comes to the government i think you personally your own agency you can kind of give yourself a reason to get up in the morning you can kind of put things in place that can give you the judge um, that you need in order to make life worth living but when you keep lo- when you keep looking over i don't know at, um the houses of parliament and you're hearing these elected officials you know who are meant to be guiding you through this difficult period making mistake after mistake after mistake that you think right of course you know armchair quarterback position but there are some clear um errors there's some clear missteps there are some clear um oversights that are really concerning when you look at the overall picture where we kind of want to go of course the christmas thing is one of the first things to sort of note right we're meant to have this weird five-day break even though we're in the you know one of the highest tiers of lockdown at the moment we're in tier two we have a free tier system here in england where the lowest is tier one and of course the street the most tightest regulation no, the yeah the the, the free regulations are two and i guess no one sorry and then the tightest regulations are free so that system was put in place in order to kind of localize um the spread of the virus and somehow able to kind of counteract it at a local level without you know mandating national lockdowns which haven't necessarily worked themselves we've done national we've done tiered we've done regional nothing seems to be working and um you would assume there'd be some level of responsibility you know clean from this okay cool we fucked up we've not got it right let's just go back to the drawing board and see where where we have got things right and try and basically double down on those and do away with the things that we haven't done right but no instead we've got more talk or more rumors as of this morning about a tier four being introduced especially for london because we have a special mutation of covid that is um uh you know uh rampaging its way through the southeast of england so there's this idea that okay in order to avoid a national lockdown let's introduce another tier which was going to you know 
be basically a, a version of national lockdown, but only for a specific area, a regional lockdown of the strictest extent, I'm assuming, all closures of non-essential shops and all that malarkey. And um, so far, there's no no news, you know, no one's really spoken about it ever since. Um, well, it's only been yesterday, actually, the rumours started circulating, but usually with the UK government, they usually try and leak um, developments um, concerning what they're going to do with COVID to broadsheets and, you know, tabloid papers in order to kind of gauge the sentiment of the public. And then they use that information to kind of, you know, refine their messaging, refine their approach, and then present that to the Great British public sometime on Monday morning, I'm assuming. But either way, um, interesting state of affairs regardless. But, you know, what can we do? We try and make the best of it. We have a jam-packed show for you today, or I have a jam-packed show for you today. And it, don't you hate when people say we, and as you know, it's quite clearly them doing everything. Like, I upload this, I do the clips, I do the titles, I make the thumbnails, you know what I mean? It's like, who else is doing it? And people say we all the time, like they're on some big, serious XM sort of production, you know, thing. It's like, what's the point? I guess it's a, you want to give the illusion that you're, Maybe it's not the illusion. Maybe it's more so the idea that you want to feel like everybody's connected, that we're all kind of in this together. But we're not really, are we? Because I'm the one talking. <laughs> we're not really in this together. Um, that's a false equivalent. <laughs> that's a, that's some false bondage. Uh, is that making any sense? False bondage? Whatever. You know what I mean. Anyway, regardless, jam pack show for you today. Loads of things to get stuck in in so make sure you grab yourself a little drinky i've got myself a little cup of coffee get yourself a little munch whatever it may be and let's dive on deep so first things first we've got this interesting article and point of debate for myself concerning Oli gun so shark at manchester united this is from sky sports news yep you got here it says the following has manchester united experiment worked two years on Subtitle says Ole Gunnar Solskjaer took over Jose Mourinho at Old Trafford two years ago on Sunday. Of course, and United are playing Leeds on Sunday. Um, the title says, if I could just read the article and then I'll give my opinions as we go along. It says Ole Gunnar Solskjaer took over Jose Mourinho two years ago today. Has experiment of appointing an experienced manager player worked? Perhaps the most telling answer to that question: for 731 days, around 250 million on transfer spend, and 71 league games later, is that the jury is still out on ex United forward. Have United progressed in this time since Jose Mourinho was sacked and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer brought in? Only Mourinho has a higher win percentage of any other four permanent Man United managers since Ed Ferguson retired in 2013. But only Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and David Moes have failed to win silverware during their time in a hot seat, and the latter was only given nine months to do so. Um, what changed under Solskjaer? As in now being, as is now being seen in the other end of the country at Tottenham Hotspur, the football uh, which predates Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's tenure at Old Trafford is often pragmatic. When it works, Mourinho has never been one to for tiki taka, or neither was um, Louis Van Gaal, who has since defended his boring style of football before him. After years of being entertained by Ferguson's winners, United supporters were never likely to be um, wedded to either of these styles in the long term. It was no surprise that it was one of the first things Solskjaer said about changing when he took over. Defensively, United have re regained some of the form of solidity. Uh, after making Harry Maguire the world's most expensive centre defender to join Aaron Bissaka in a new look back line in the summer of 2019, conceding only three goals more than Champions League last season, but it was with the ball where the most pronounced talk about changes has been seen. I have an issue with this. I, again, I'm, I, I, I'm, the jury's out for me on Solskjaer. I still think he's done a okay job, considering. I think when you consider the sentiment it depends. If it's just strictly from a footballing point of view, he's done okay. Trophy's point of view, of course, he's not won anything. But I think it's a little bit more holistic with Solskjaer. You know, he came in off the back of a very toxic tenure with Jose Mourinho, right? The Mourinho you see now at Tottenham was not the Mourinho we had at Man United for a whole bevy of reasons. Now, it could be because Mourinho was was sort of hired and was given the impression that United were going to hire us director of football. They were going to do certain things to change the way the club operated in order to make us a force again. And then when he got in, quite quickly especially when the results weren't going his way the board sort of recanted on the promises and he was kind of left alone to sort of suffer the blows from the press um, ridicule from the fans and just in general his kind of quality as a manager was sort of questioned at that time people were thinking oh, has he lost it um, is he going to be a top manager ever again 
blah de blah 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 but as we've seen with his success at Tottenham Mourinho is obviously a good manager he can still coach to a certain level and his approach however pragmatic it may be does work whether or not it works at the top 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 level like teams like you know Real Madrid Man United well Real Madrid specifically is a good example Real Madrid Man United probably not so much because we weren't really pulling up any trees prior to him um, being hired but this kind of stature and caliber of club especially the fan expectations it's very difficult to convince Real Madrid and Man United fans that it's okay for us to park the bus against the better teams and hit them on the counter um, or take our chances that way and then when we get two goals up just shut up shop regardless if it's 60th minute or 25th minute those fan bases just aren't going to accept it so that approach doesn't really work for him but when he's at Inter when you think of Porto you think of his time now at Tottenham you think of course of his tenure at Chelsea when they didn't really have much success or whatever he gave to them was a bonus but these 10 these sort of managerial tenures for him worked because the the team was basically or the club was basically set up for him to win that a sort of underground the underdog sort of scrappy mentality the issue i have with social at the moment is that it kind of feels like people do two of two things at the same time they both want to say give him time because he's young he doesn't have experience quote unquote but then they also want to say he's done a lot in during the time but he hasn't won any trophies so i guess two things can be right at the same time but it's a bit of a contradiction that's the thing I have with it. When it comes to the signings, I think he's done pretty well. Um, in terms of the players and how they've been performing, I still think overall there's some mistakes being made. I don't think Harry Maguire is ever the world's most expensive centre-back. I think he's mediocre at best. I think players like Tchaikovsky, um, Lewis Dunk, um, the few other centre-backs in the Premier League would say that they were probably comparable in skill set to Harry Maguire or if not probably a little bit a level above i think of a ben white these guys have much higher ceilings than a harry maguire um which is concerning considering that ollie got one ollie obviously wants to play football out from the back so signing a player like harry maguire doesn't really make that much sense that being said and then you look at one but is the same thing too excellent defender in one-on-one in one-on-one situations not very good in terms of defensively keeping his shape um you know obviously of course not really good on the ball either so that negates the whole point of playing out for the back he's over reliance on luke shaw is interesting even though he bought alex tellers of course that shows that maybe he does not really convince with luke shaw but still i was a bit concerned by that and then, of course, Bruno Fernandes, the enigma, the man, the myth, the legend, has been an undeniable success at the moment. But it was also a long period of time where there was a, uh, it felt like there was an insistence to kind of play him at the, you know, at the detriment of a Pogba when really they should be playing together. So there's been some inconsistencies there. But again, overall, I think in terms of vibe, in terms of sentiment, in terms of looking forward to games, like I look forward to seeing May Night play again now before I didn't. So those things are definitely in his favour. So I think he's done a successful job in that regard. It says the following. In the 21 matches Solskjaer got saw in his first season, his counter-attacking side allowed United, sorry, his counter-attacking side allowed United to mount six times the number of uh, fast breaks that Mourinho's had in only three matches more. anti Martial Marcus Rashford, who had started only 35 games between them in 2017-18, were now thrust front and centre. Uh, quote here, Manchester United looked like the Manchester United of 10 to 5 years ago. Gary Neville said in Sky Sports a month after Solskjaer took over following a 1-0 win at Tottenham, their fifth Premier League win in a row. They've got the counter-attack back. Um, they certainly had, but that weapon could only take them so far. 23 months on, United have picked up 21 points per game from a 19 matches where they have less of the ball. And that sort of tally, which has made, um, which could mount a serious title charge there where they have had more than 50% of possession. That figure drops to 1.7, um, one points per game and just 25 wins from 52 matches. It says the arrival of Bruno Fernandes in January was met meant to fix that issue and the results suggest it worked since then United have undefeated when they have uh, had more of the ball winning 12 and drawing 5 but against the top sides it's yet uh, it's yet providing enough um, for games against Chelsea Arsenal and Manchester United season United have only secured 2 points quote in the next uh, six to eight months, they have to dominate matches and dominate big games. Never told uh, Sky Sports last weekend of the board drawing City. He said that would be the determining factor for Oli, which I definitely agree with that one. Um, and that was, again, that was a, probably one of the main issues I had with the City derby. 
you know, Man City are under force that they were prior. I think Pep is maybe a spent force, not because of his um, ability to coach, but I just think his style of coaching, there's only so far you can push players to play the way he wants them to play. Um, you saw it happen at Roman, so you saw it happen at Barcelona, you saw it happen at Bayern Munich. It's a kind of a common theme with these sort of like managers that have this sort of, I won't say high octane, but this really detail orientated, position based, systems based way of playing. There's only so far those players, especially if you have complete players that you trust so you're going to keep using the same one season to season now they've heard the same message they're not really going to be motivated or pepped but in the same way that they would in the past so it's very difficult to make that work so this is opportunity to kind of mount a serious title charge with only Liverpool being the only kind of world-class standard bearer team in the league at the moment um, and I felt like that derby game was a good chance to take to kind of you know for us to put our flag in the ground and say hey we've arrived and we're kind of being serious about this and I felt like um, again, we didn't approach the game in a way that would be conducive of winning. Um, I think the tactics were essentially to play for a draw and hopefully nick a, uh, a win off the break, which again isn't the way that you should, United should be playing against the bigger sides. We should be dominating them and kind of all going blow for blow at least. So that would probably be a concern for me, I think. Continuing. He said um, they have to stop uh, playing as a team and perform. Today was okay, but it's not just a tactic for Manchester United to win football matches in the long term or win titles. All the teams who have won titles dominate football matches. Dominating possession, being on the front foot and winning big matches, Oli hasn't got United there yet and he's been in the job two years. That's a very good um, criticism and analysis and it kind of reminds me of that. My One of my favourite kind of derby games against Liverpool was the one under Louis van Gaal where Mata scores that kind of bicycle kick, right? Because we absolutely played them off the park. Like, we bossed them off the park. Like, you know, possession-based football. We had probably, I'm going to say something crazy, like 80% possession in the first 20 minutes. They didn't get a sniff of the ball. We t we kind of pulled them apart left to right. And that was the one time I saw that Louis van Gaal style of football that he was trying to implement in our team, the benefits of it. Against the smaller sides, it's annoying because if they have a low block and you got the ball, it's just, you know, you kind of end up playing out these really boring making your eyes bleed one nil victories that you know don't inspire any confidence but i think against the bigger sides when they obviously want to attack and they're leaving spaces behind that possession style of football is crucial to securing some level of victory so i, I that was one of my favorite games and i would love for that to be a common theme of united when we go play the bigger sides so that would be cool to see that being implemented but again i just don't think that's all his style he seems to prefer the sort of fast counter attacking football um, but again, does he have the players to do so? Probably not. Let's continue. Question of recruitment. David Gill's name does not get mentioned regularly when assessing what changed at United since Ferguson retired in 2013. But the man who replaced Chief Executive, Ed Woodward, has at times been um, more in the limelight than the four permanent managers he has worked with. This has, this has not changed under the current regime, which is definitely true. And I think a lot of the reason, well, a lot of the reason why managers don't succeed at the club has to do with Ed Woodward, has to do with the Glazers, has to do with, what's his name? Um, Joe Bust, whatever that fucking guy's name is, right? There's a few other people. But essentially, they've not provided each manager with a structure that's in place that can allow them to succeed. I think Silas Ferguson was an anomaly. He was one of the, you know, like Arsene Wenger, those coaches don't come, you know, around often. The kind of managers that are able to direct the club from the top to the bottom, from like the boardroom level all the way to kind of youth team football. They don't exist nowadays. Nowadays, you have managers who are basically very adept at coaching size, you know, very adept at implementing tactical formational systems and whatever it may be, but probably aren't the most um, adept in terms of drawing up a list of potential targets or um, negotiating contracts or whatever it may be or kind of implementing um, direction for the youth team setup like these are all these things that sometimes shouldn't be put at the table of the first team coach because they have enough to deal with just coaching the side as it is and with Ed Woodward considering how you know how uh, you know diabolical the Glazers reign has been at United the amount of money they've been extracting from the club you would assume they'd want to cover their asses and just implement a system that would allow them to sort of hire and fire as they please but also provide managers who do succeed with a platform to kind of shine 
you know, whether it's hiring a director of football, whether it's changing the recruitment process, whether it's identifying players of a certain profile, whatever it may be, like that would be the perfect approach. But instead, Ed Woodward has hired managers, given them an open checkbook, um, then then signed a couple of the players that they, whoever the manager wanted, and then refused to sign the others. Then when they saw it was going wrong, they suddenly pulled the funds and just fired them and then restarted again. And because it's led by Ed Woodward too, it feels like again from the outside looking in there's no real pattern there's no real plan there's no real idea behind the coaches we hire right um there's no real link between david moyes louis van gaal Mourinho, or social apart from they all manage united there's no there's nothing to tie them in stylistically um there's nothing to tie them in philosophically wise in terms of football how they view the game they're completely different people um and unlike um, unfortunately when each of them leaves they other managers to come in and sort of restructure the club to their liking whilst having players that they didn't sign so that is sometimes one of the big issues that kind of stares you know managers in the face it continues here says things to be things um look to be taking a turn for the better um at first with soul shrug determined to build the right atmosphere the club dressing room something which had been taken for worse under Mourinho and shy shows like louis van uh, paul Popper's never ending transfer saga um do not do much to keep the narrative on getting results which is yeah, somewhat true. I think again, that's how you have to judge Solskjaer because I think we forget how quickly in football, just how toxic it was at the club when Mourinho in charge. He wasn't enjoying his time at the club. He obviously had um some promises broken. Maybe he realized that it wasn't really the job for him. Because I do maintain Mourinho was a perfect appointment to bring in post Fergie. I don't think it should have ever been David Moyes. And I think since then maybe he kind of carried a bit of resentment with him inside about United in general he lived in the hotel he didn't want to there were lots of things that he just didn't seem like he was ever in sync with the club in general he did try to do his best of course he won us Europa League and you know was instrumental in some really fun games you know took us to the what, our highest position in the league finished in second but in general it wasn't the best of time underneath under him right um and i think the atmosphere and change room chant in the changing room and in the training ground was a bit bleak so a change was needed and i guess all shock was a perfect remedy for that him being a club legend and all okay next year I just kick him out so it continues um by then the arrivals of Maguire, one bissaka and fernandez to the greater less extent had appeared to be the step in the right direction Jaden satcher could have added to the list in the summer but had botched approach from united over the number one target was labeled embarrassing by neville and quickly led to more questions about the cubs approach to signings he said the sancho thing is embarrassing it's been going on now for four months and it's embarrassing that he told the off-ball podcast and then you put the bit the bid in that gets rejected the smart clubs they have the deal sorted behind the scenes the agents are working hard club officials are agreed on things when the bids goes in it gets accepted it's done donny van de Vick, uh facundo pastrilli amad diallo look like social shark signings players with something to prove on their way up the kind of players ferguson would have admired but house manager ensures fiascos like the sancho saga do not happen again maybe much of a mystery uh, to him than anyone Good news regarding that, though. According to the um, Transfer Window podcast by Duncan Castle, um, United are seriously looking at a director of football. For, like, this has been the most serious we've been over you know, the last few years. We've got a short list of people. I think five names mentioned. I think I heard Mark Overmars. I heard Paul Mitchell. Um, I heard Luis Campos, who Mourinho actually recommended, but we didn't want to um, even interview him, and a, few, and a couple of other people. So there is a serious push for a football director coming forward, and I think we need that going forward. We can't be in a position where if Solskjaer does end up getting fired, we just have a manager coming in and signing whoever players he wants for the vision that he has, and then we just start again from scratch. We have to have a director of football in who can also um, you know, uh, be consulted and maybe steer the direction as to who we do go after in terms of managerial profile because maybe it's not the obvious maybe the next manager isn't just Poch or Julian Nagelsmann maybe it's somebody that we haven't really rec- you know kind of noticed who's doing good things who might have the main DNA sort of seeping through and we haven't really paid attention to these are all things that we need to consider but again with our director of football it's very very difficult for those things to kind of um, come to any sort of fruition um so yeah so it's a long article not read the whole thing but he has done some positive again i think overall for me <clears throat> as a united fan i would say i'm still not sold on him i still think there are better coaches out there that we could get um i think that's 
basically his problem i think he might be perfect for united at this current stage but is he perfect in terms of is he the best coach um out there at the moment i don't think so i don't think even the ollie innes can say that he's doing a good job it's a similar to like i think if like somebody like a mark hughes who's been you know a pretty diabolical manager came into united and somehow did a good job um i don't think fans will turn against him because he's mark hughes so he might play for city and he's a bit of a cunt I think people will still be behind him. So I think the same goes for Soul Shark, you know, and of course he's got the advantage of being a likable guy. So people want to root for him, they want him to win. But there's also a part of me that thinks, you know, <clears throat> a manager at this level who makes the mistakes that he does with formation, with tactics, with substitutions, with, you know, in-game management, I just don't see how that kind of manager can be able to, can be expected to win the league or the Champions League. It just doesn't happen. You don't fluke your way to those, especially the league title. I think in Champions League, you've got a chance because it's a cup competition, you know, anyone can win. Um, but I don't think you can do that with the league title. League titles are usually given to the team that really deserves it, you know, over what, 30 plus matches, playing consistently at a certain level, playing against some of the, you know, best teams in the country who are always challenging, always pushing you. There's no gimmies. There's no, <clears throat> there's no facing you know, Celta Vigo, you know, at home in the Premier League, every game is essentially like a FA Cup final. So it's a big deal. So I think winning the league just requires more from the manager. It requires more. It, it just requires that extra thing that I don't think Solskjaer generally does have. Now, the issue is to counteract that would be, he's obviously proved if he's given the players that he can get something out of this team and squad. They just seem to be able to play for him, play in a certain type of way. Whenever his job is in question, they pull out a flipping stellar performance. There is something about his connection with these players that seems to work. So there is a theory out there that if you do give him a blank checkbook and let him sign the players he wants in the style of Pep Guardiola, you know, he doesn't like a right back, you sign another one, he doesn't like that one, you sign another one again. Um, <clears throat> that's the only way we're going to be successful. But, under in, under his stewardship but the issue i have at the moment is so far with the glazers they've shown a reluctance to spend really big and address the issues the holes that we have because you know this summer i've just gone we all kind of may not have found earmarked i think about five players we possibly needed and we ended up getting what three so there's obviously an issue there in terms of just signing and acquiring players we don't seem to do it at the level that we need to really progress in the shortest space of time of course so that's the issue. So if you're going to have Solskjaer be your manager, but you're not going to let him spend how he wants to spend, and you're also not going to support him in the transfer market when he needs to support, then you just have to hire a manager in who wants, who's able to work under those constraints and who's able to coach okay players into being world beaters. And I think that's why people keep mentioning people like Julian Algusman, or people like, uh, you know, of course, Mauricio Pochettino, because they've proved so far, especially with Junior so far, you know, in recent times, you know, having been knocked out by those guys, that they can get a song and dance out of players that you probably haven't never heard of, right? Players who wouldn't command the 50 plus million dollar, you know, um, transfer um, fees. So that is definitely something that I think the club are definitely looking at in terms of what what works going forward with with this team what works going forward on this manager after the stewardship and what makes sense in terms of making sure we get back on top because i'm not sold on this idea that social is the guy personally but again i'm happy to be proven wrong some of his achievements so far so i made a list here number one he's got the biggest home win since um Sarah's Reagan retired first team in history to overturn a two goal deficit away from home in Champions League against Paris and Germain of course um won successive nine away games for the first time in the club's history um equaled the Premier League record by winning his first six matches in charge matching Pepe and Ancelotti finished either third or fourth in the competitions he managed in his first full season in charge most goals scored by United team 2013 so loads of really good achievements again none trophy wise but there's obviously some progress. There's about 24 things listed here that Solskjaer has done over his time. Um, again, whether he's given the time to do so, I don't think that will happen. I think the guys will get too twitchy, especially if we end up finishing outside the top four this season, even though there's a chance we can win the league. But let's see going forward. Um, again, if I had to rate it from as like a grade, I'd say he's probably got a B plus, if not a C. Um, it'll be cool to see us kick on. And again, with the title race being wide open, with Liverpool being the only real, you know, stellar team in the league, there's definitely an opportunity for someone to come in and challenge them and push them all the way until the end at least. And who knows, maybe, you know, squeeze them right at the end there with a couple points. It could be done. It could be done. But again, if you're a United fan, let me know. 
do you um, do you think Solskjaer's first two years in the club have been successful? Um, do you think he should be given more time? Do you think trophies are everything? Um, let me know in your comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Next on the list, what else do we have here? Mm -mm -mm. Oh yes, the best news that we all wanted to hear in it. So it's been um it's been said and there's some rumors rumblings out there online that supposedly the government are looking at implementing a third national lockdown in the uk to stem the spread of covid19 um you know ahead i guess yeah after the christmas break which is insane if you think about it right we have this weird little grace period that they've sort of implemented where we can socialize and mix with different households for a five-day period um during christmas which you know a lot of people have um rightfully called out and said it's probably the wrong approach but it seems like this government the more you keep calling them out the more you keep questioning their directives um the more you provide them with evidence that might can track what they're trying to do they just love to double down you know sort of anchor their feet into the ground and just keep on steaming through um which is you know i guess it's probably a mark of leadership but sometimes in this scenario that we're in at the moment it can be a bit frustrating it can feel like you're sort of speaking into the void when it comes to what the government will go through with covid but um again the numbers do look scarily high um you know the i think there are not numbers above 1.5 last time i checked um there's this weird mutation that's sort of spreading across the southeast of england so there's definitely issues that are in place here but sometimes you look at these situations that we're in and you think to yourself it's less about what we do in the next month and it's more so about what we didn't do in the past four months right why didn't we sort of even the schools is a good thing why didn't we wind down the schools um a couple of weeks or kind of you know lock them down for a couple of weeks before christmas because usually if you've ever been you know in sort of like secondary school especially the couple of weeks before christmas are basically you're not doing anything right the teachers don't want to exert themselves because they can't wait to go home to their families the kids are basically not even present they're already thinking about their presence it's like a completely it's a complete non-event they could have easily wind down the schools close them for two weeks before um you know everyone kind of officially goes back home anyway and then just extended the lockdown up until this date maybe still given a five-day grace period and then maybe open it up later on but this whole like especially in london where we, we were in tier two for like a week or maybe two weeks or something people went completely crazy went outside as as you'd expect them to do right it's been locked in indoors all day isn't the most humane and sensible way to go about these things but people went out for the last two weeks so i did their thing and then suddenly now you sort of like turning off the tap again but the damage has been done for the most part it feels like but anyway um this is boris johnson basically expanding on it and kind of giving his vague non-answers that kind of lead you to, to believe that this third lockdown is probably coming so brace yourselves if you're feeling negative <clears throat> well obviously we're, we're hoping very much that we'll be able to avoid anything like that but the the reality is that the uh, rates of infection have increased very much in the last few weeks uh, here where i am in the in the northwest in uh, in bolton they've actually done a fantastic job in bringing it down if you look at what people have done uh, in greater manchester really heroic effort and if you're listening the sound that is going is happening that's not me it's him wearing his flipping hybrid vest and moving his hands you know like a lunatic to get the disease under control so what we're <coughs> saying to people now uh, over uh, this this christmas period is you know think of those uh, those rules about the, the three households that you can bubble up with uh, the five days that is very much a maximum that's not a, a target people should aim for and i think people really get this people do get this all, all the things i'm seeing all the evidence i'm seeing is people really understand this is the time to look after uh think about our elderly relatives avoid spreading the disease uh keep it short keep it small you know have a have yourselves a, a very little christmas as i said as i said uh, the other night that is i'm afraid the way through this year these those little mantras that they sort of trot out are so you know i won't say demeaning but they're so patronizing in it smarter smaller simpler merry little christmas like go fuck yourself really um anyway and it kind of expands itself a little bit on here 
what's going to happen from the BBC, hoping to avoid a national lockdown. It says the following, the PM says he's hoping to avoid another national lockdown in England, but that the COVID-19 cases have increased very much in recent weeks. He chaired meetings on Friday at number 10, sources said, and made growing concerns about the spread of the COVID-19. Um, health bosses have warned the NHS is already under significant pressure, and nearly 90% of the beds in England are full, which is absolutely insane to think about. The government scientists are continuing to evaluate this new strain, and ministers have been discussing what action would be necessary to deal with it ask if the people were going to be told to rethink their christmas plans a downing street source said we are not there yet but hold press development over the night um rumors were abound and this dude on twitter basically shared that supposedly sources tonight implying the christmas bubble could be popped he says a caveat um the doubt decision made on this yet but hearing much the same at all reportings of the sun and the telegraph and if essentially the sun and the telegraph are reporting that they might be a bit of a change in terms of the christmas bubble and they might just scrap it in general especially in the south just because of what's been happening with the numbers going exponentially high um which makes sense again um, i think the christmas thing was always a bit weird for me i was always under the impression that it would make more sense to maybe ask the population especially since most of us have been living under some level of restrictions for what eight months plus in some cases 10 if you've kind of been aware of it since february you've been living under some level of restrictions for 10 months or so it would make more sense to be like hey population um, instead of us celebrating Christmas, um, you know, the traditional way, why don't we just do it at home in our own abode and kind of share, you know, whatever we could make it as, make it as fun as we can with the idea that if we lock down and be serious now and don't go out and socialize, then we can possibly have a better new year going forward. But it just feels like with this approach, this kind of laissez faire, hands off approach, wishy washy vagueness that we have going on at the moment, more likely than not, we're going to be under, you know, numerous lockdowns in a new in a new year not only one so if you're thinking hey that one in january is bad enough definitely hold your braces because for sure if that happens it's going to be more coming down the down what well, more further down the line which is really frustrating considering there's so many easy things that we could do now to kind of mitigate the spread of it but you know the government seemed to be reluctant to do so but hey what can we do just report the news just talk about these issues there's nothing really we can do situation this sort of reminds me of like you know when you're at a house party somewhere yacked off your face they're talking about how you could fix the world's problems and with um bogey running down your nose somewhere um you think you've got all the answers you think you know what is a solution but sometimes things are probably a little bit more complicated than you really led to believe you'd hope so right you'd hope there's probably a lot more that they're sort of considering that we're not really privy to that's affecting the situation in place i remember reading something about them that's why they've been kind of mum on the whole vaccine thing there's not really been a lot of talk about that they haven't really given us any timelines of when the the, the the nation could get vaccinated and things and kind of given something to aim for because the idea is that they don't want to give people a false sense of security so they go out and be crazy which is you know understandable it's a bit of a wild thing to say but it's understandable so there's definitely some rationale behind these decisions but just from a you know regular day you know average person on the street it just doesn't make any sense really you know to open things up then to close them down again and then to open them up again just for christmas then to close them down again for the new year is like so backwards it beggars belief but hey what can we do next on the list if that wasn't bad enough if the covid situation wasn't bleak enough for you um new spread the other day i think what two days ago regarding Berghain, and supposedly there was a fire that took place just outside of Berghain, right i think when i first saw it on the on the tl the old timeline it did look like it was the actual building itself but i think due to further um reportage by people that were on the ground it looks like it was an adjacent building that basically going on fire but luckily because the Berghain is literally you know around the corner or up across the road from a fire station they were able to come across and basically diffuse the situation pretty quickly but it did feel like the perfect sort of crescendo the perfect climax the perfect conclusion the perfect ending to an absolutely shitty year that the one kind of you know dance institution the one some, the one mecca the one quote-unquote church that most dance fans are sort of addicted and you know to you know from my home from home would succumb to the you know the, the consequences of such a shitty year and go up in flames <clears throat> it felt like you know poetic was that poetic justice it felt like um it felt like the poetic end that you would expect for this year. That's what it felt like. 
but luckily that's not the case so this is from this guy called um, daniel ryan spaulding i think you remember the dude he's the guy that does the whole Belair thing right that whole comedy sketch it's a bit you know it's a bit trite he kind of um rinsed that um sponge very very dry but hey you gotta do what you have to do so he reported the following 2020 is complete a fire at the Bergheim, though the building itself my eyewitnesses um though not the building itself my eyewitnesses. it says um daniel will rebuild um the ruins tomorrow like a true whatever that word is circa 1945 thank you to the sexy firefighters for saving the day i think someone made a joke as well that supposedly they didn't let the firefighters in so they couldn't stop the fire but hardy ha ha regardless um it's not that big of a deal i guess it's okay it's fine um no no damage has been made the decks are okay your dark rooms are saved but still imagine if it did when it went up in flame just imagine the uproar um on social especially for the people that were like you know at the beginning of the lockdown were bemoaning this place and the scene and lack of inclusion <laughs> no one wanted to go up in flames i mean the what the, the best thing everyone wants is for it to be reopened and for re, uh, reparations to be evenly doled out to <laughs> minority communities that's what you'd love to see in it and then i guess someone's got a video here of the outside um, I guess the, the caption says, just walk past this. I had a better view than the flames as I was walking past, but there were a lot of police and firefighters around, so I didn't want to get in the way and make it a video. It's the complete opposite of how we approach these situations in the UK, in the Europe, I guess, vis-a-vis um, -vis our American uh, neighbours, right? They would be all up in there making noise. Oh my God, oh my God. I mean, we, we, like, we're so polite. We're sort of trying to film these kind of tragedies and crazy situations from afar, you know not being too that that's my theory why we don't see too many of these sort of like public freakouts public you know street fights on websites somewhere you do see some of them but not to a certain extent you see them you know displayed on places like world star hip-hop we're just too polite for it we see someone fighting on the bus every single day we just keep it moving for the most part you just put your head down in the book or turn your music on louder jeremy so you can kind of drown it all out um no one really cares too tough about this kind of things but anyway continues thankfully they did seem to have a pretty well under control by the time we left. So thank God the venue is so close to the fire station across the road. I um, hope everyone is safe and the venue didn't suffer much damage. Looking forward to getting back in there as soon as we're allowed back. Who had the Bergam fire on the 2020 bingo card? Yeah, very, very true, man. That's a perfect statement to make there. Who had it on their bingo card? And like I said, I think it would have been... It, it didn't happen but it would it would have it, it it doesn't sound too far-fetched considering how crappy things have been it wouldn't sound too far-fetched that you know on the last month of the year especially a month where i would assume it's probably might be one of their best nights best months in the year i would assume december january right they've got that sylvester night that they do the kind of new year's eve thing I remember back in the day, I remember seeing that. I remember back in the day, there was a listing. Someone listed a ticket for a New Year's Eve Bergheim event for like 700 euros or dollars, I think, back in the day. They sold it for, and it's actually sold. So just imagine, um, you know, how that must have felt. But yeah, there's a video. Looks like it's like the, the side of it as you're kind of walking up. It looks like crazy you know but at least it's good to know that it's okay no um crisis avoided your dance floor will be back with you very very soon let's get rid of that then let's go here so what else we got to talk about here let's go through the list okay boom let's move on we have an update so of course most of you are aware that um the youtubers logan paul and jake paul have essentially um decided to wreak havoc and declare war on all combat sports athletes whether they're boxers mma fighters or whatever they may be they've decided to call out everyone under the sun in an effort to bo bolster or boost whatever this new um approaches to fights at the moment where you kind of marry up you kind of marry up these celebrity influencer public figure fights with actual professional fighters fighting for car fighting for titles whatever they may be to boost obviously their exposure and to potentially rewrite the sport of boxing which has kind of suffered because it's maybe from the usc maybe it's because people have moved on or maybe just you know it's a cycle of time but there does seem to be less of a, a chatter online concerning 
boxing in general now it could be an internal thing it could be because there's so many commissions promoters uh you know people padding their records and special interest in charge and you know the judging is horrendous and fixed there's probably something at play there that's definitely affecting the way people have kind of responded to boxing but there's definitely something going on in there where somehow the public consensus the general fan who I would assume is the one that really pays the bills and you know is in the stadiums watching these things and buying the merch has maybe moved on UFC's maybe of course played a big role in it I think the way you know say what you want about Dana and his lack or unwillingness to pay the fighters what they're worth and the fact that they essentially put their lives online you know um you know on a basically a month by month basis for little to no money what they do do really well uh, because they're the only promoters in town is that they do put on the fights that fans actually want to see you know number two versus number three to to have a chance to face number one there's no going back and forth and for, face somebody outside the top 20 just to pad your record you get thrown in lines then straight away to prove your worth which is why we get the special fights that we get and obviously the you know undisputed champions that we get along the way so that might have kind of captured people's imagination but again me i'm no big fan of the whole influencers fighting professional athletes again i've had limited experience in martial arts you know having done a month doing you know muay thai on a on the back of a groupon discount and um i gained a lot of respect for fighting basically i've i figured out quite quickly that hey i can't fight if i was involved in some sort of altercation with somebody that had any level of experience i'd get washed and it gave me a whole different level of appreciation and respect for the sport and it also let me know that there is a definitely a big gap between people that are fighting at the amateur level let's say right um you know working a nine to five and fighting on the weekend sometimes here and there to people that are fighting in professional organizations there's a big level of gap even from experience level so i can i can, I can only imagine what the level of the skill gap must be when it comes to somebody who essentially made their entire career doing pranks on youtube to suddenly to start to fight people it's just not the same it just won't happen so sometimes i think it's not necessarily it might be a spectacle for the logan brothers because i think for the paul brothers sorry because i think in general they're both not really well liked i guess maybe more so in jake's case but they don't have the best reputation so maybe part of the law is that people want to see them getting knocked out similar to the appeal of what floyd mayweather had when he was fighting you know the part of the reason why people kind of tuned in to his fights was because he played this heel character braggadocious um sort of like in your face champion that everyone went to see sort of knocked down a peg or two it never unfortunately happened for for those guys anyway but that might be the appeal of it anyway fast forward um i guess jake paul wants to call out uc fires if i think he even decided unwittingly to call out dylan dennis one of uh, conor mcgregor's um training partners and also somebody who is a you know jujitsu savant in his own regard and somebody who you'd think would be a bad decision for him to decide to fight especially in the octagon doesn't make any sort of sense so some prank happened well it's not a prank some uh altercation happened between the both of those guys where essentially he kind of pulled up to dylan dennis during an interview that he was doing with brendan shaw for his uh food truck diaries on below the belt and the instance i saw it i knew straight away it was fake it was looked flipping so you know uh done in a way that you would kind of assume those kind of youtube pranks are done and i just didn't know what purpose it served because i think like again let, let's watch the video and you could make a decision but i just think it's a bit pointless this is the video itself it's just like kind of my personality and that's the thing with marcel too is like he was getting mad at me for like hey, it's it's a, bitch right this fucking there. guy bro pussy 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 <laughs> Fucking motherfucker, bro. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Was it a water balloon? I don't know what it was. To be honest, because I got close to him, he hit me with like some metal. But it was, I think it was a water balloon. I was gonna try to jump on the truck, but I couldn't get it. Dude, if we would have jumped, I was so truck. close. So I was gonna try to duck it and hit me with the thing. There's a lot of dudes in that truck. Thank I couldn't God get that, close because that didn't happen. He drove off. Right I when I was close. And if, if they would have jumped out, then I gotta get involved. I gotta dust off the old old skill set i don't think he would actually box me either and they're like you don't you don't think jake no nah, i don't think so but the thing is is like gonna that, that's gonna get them millions of views yeah and when you guys fight like that translates dollars for you i wish you would have got out yeah can we go find them now do you have a car come on that that the, 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 if i've ever seen anything more faker um i don't know 
it's just it, it seems like a complete waste of time to me i just don't understand um nothing to prove whether they if they fight in a ring maybe let's say the Dallas is striking isn't the best i don't know i've not really seen any of his striking most of his fights i've seen he's basically just smushed a person grappled them to the ground and strangled them or ripped their kneecap off which makes complete sense just considering how high level he is at jujitsu so maybe he's his striking is as bad as you know most grapplers is because he just focuses on his strength but still i would wager that he's probably of a higher level and caliber than the Jake Paul. It just is the fact. It just has to be. Somebody that does this every single day for, you know, the best part of what, 10 plus years, they are going to be bound to be better than somebody that just jumps into this because they decided to, they're bored of YouTube. It just has to be the case. Then you think of it from a Brendan Shaw point of view, and of course it makes sense for him, you know, because he's, you know, he's always kind of wanting to be a bit of a celebrity, you know, pundit kind of guy, and he sort of inserted himself into this situation, front and centre, even though he wasn't necessarily, he wasn't necessarily needed by staging this ridiculous um, encounter with these two guys. Obviously, he would say he's very good friends with Logan, which basically means, you know, they've exchanged a couple DMs on Instagram, but regardless of the fact, it's just, it's a bit embarrassing. It really is, especially for somebody that, like, like um, Brendan, who was so hard on you know what's his name cm punk when he first came into the ufc and saying that he shouldn't be in there and of course his comments regarding greg hardy it's just really ironic that now he's somehow you know championing the prospects of the logan brothers essentially deciding and picking and choosing who they want to fight in the ufc in order to kind of boost their rep rep and inevitably supposedly put money in the back of the pocket of these fighters again i still think not all good not all money is good money yes he, get, he gets a payday but what does it serve um didn't dan is taking time out of his training camp to fight for someone that he shouldn't be fighting in order to get more money in his pocket which is not going to further his career it's not going to make him look more badass it's not going to allow him to you know fight for a title anytime soon it doesn't answer any questions that people have about his skill set it does absolutely nothing apart from you know stroking of the ego and of course inflating the bank account but is that really worth the squeeze considering um everything that's going to go into it promotion all this sort of stuff it just seems like a bit of an exhaustive process and maybe the resources could be much best used or placed in other places now that being said um i did see something online with somebody that i would love to see fight um jake paul this was let me see if i can get it up on here da, da, da. let me get up in one second da, da, da. Give me come on come on come on come on come on work so there we go so this guy i would love to see fight jake paul actually going forward just for like a just in terms of a not in terms of a lesson, but just in terms of a kind of, let's just, let's just remind everybody what the levels are. Cause I think a Dylan Dennis thing is different because he's young, he's up and coming. He's obviously got a point to prove, right? Um, there'll be a lot more excuses made for that one, but let's go in this one. Where is it? Oh, he posted it. Oh, he's it's always posting stuff. Scroll down. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? He retweeted somewhere here. Come on, 18 hours ago. It's mad when you're trying to find something on someone's Twitter and they post a million things a day. So, there we go. We have it. So, let's move this around. Uh -huh. There we go. So, if there's one person I would like to go see, uh, fight Thingamajiggy, it's this guy. Come on, load, load, load. There we go. So, apparently... Uh, Michael Bisping has been offered the fight against Jake Paul, which is insane, right? Considering that I'm pretty sure, Michael, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure um, he's known for his striking in the UFC and also as a veteran that has seen just about everything in that ring or octagon. So this is probably the fight he shouldn't be taking. If if ever there was a fight that Jake should take, it's probably Dylan Dennis, considering his experience. You know, there's probably he could probably get closer to a Dylan Dennis skill set than he could do to a Michael Bisping, considering the title fights he's been in, the fact that he was a world champion once. This is probably the fight he shouldn't take. But I love it from a spectator's point of view because I think Jake Paul fighting a forty plus year old retired UFC fighter and absolutely washed would be a great way to send a message and remind people that hey, there's levels to this shit. Somebody that's got especially you know he's got one eye riddled with injuries 
um, he could still probably beat this guy up with one hand tied behind his back. So for him to do it at a professional level, you know, on the biggest stage and get a payday, especially for like someone Michael Bisping, who some I, I absolutely rate and think is really funny and a great um, analyst and commentator on the UFC, I would love to see it. So this is Michael Bisping talking about the offer that he received from the Jake Paul team. You'd like to go and say whatever the fuck I want. So Jake Paul, if you want to fucking go, Logan Paul, if you want to go, then I guess you got to, uh, you know, Put your hands in your pockets and man up because you're talking shit. You're contacting my manager and saying that you want to fight. Well, guess what, buddy? I'm here. I'm going nowhere. Amazing. You want to fight someone? You want to test yourself? Uh, hey, I'm 0 and 0 as a boxer. You're saying you want to know? You're 2 and 0. I'm 0 and 0. I'm Technically, from the technical standpoint, he's infinitely more experienced than you in boxing. <laughs> he has, yeah, like even if I had one. And I love the fact that he's got a pair of decks in the background because I'm sure I remember Mike Bisson saying that he used to DJ back in the day um, when he used to, you know, uh, do security at, at nightclubs and stuff. Imagine if you were one of the unlucky punters that got chucked out or it got into an altercation with Michael Bisson being outside some nightclub somewhere. Like, Jesus Christ. Fight, he'd have 200 percent more or 100 yeah. percent more he, he's way more experienced as a combat sports athlete than i am you should Listen, be the underdog at the end of the day if you want to do this okay stop playing games you want to do it i'll do it i'm here no problem okay uh i'm almost 42 years old i'm a former world champion wow. and uh i will take you to school man <laughs> i'll guarantee you this you won't get out of three rounds. That's an absolute fact. You won't get out of one round, two <laughs> rounds. But we'll say three just Let's to give go. me that little, little insurance blanket. If he gets out of round two, Bisping, that's a moral loss for you and your family. <laughs> well, maybe I'm just going to take my time. Maybe I'm going to do a Floyd May with him and just play with him. No, but seriously, though, if uh, he did reach out to my management and, and asked if I would be interested, if this is a real offer, if this is serious, then uh, let me know and uh, and I'll do it. 100%. If this is a real offer from Logan Paul or Jake Paul or both of you, like to I love it. I love it, man. Again, I'm contradicting myself because I just said earlier that I think it's flipping stupid. But I, again, I think if, if there's one, if there's a fight to make, let him fight a retired 40 plus year old what x world champion so that we can see exactly what the levels are so we can put this whole thing to bed and just move on because yes the sport of boxing needs to be revitalized yes maybe it's sort of kind of falling out of the zeitgeist and falling out of the public consciousness but really is this a right way to sort of bring it back like especially the younger boxers that are coming up trying to fight for world titles and get their name on there on the marquee imagine how they must feel seeing these youtubers essentially leapfrog them and fight at madison square garden all these flipping legendary places that are usually reserved for people that can maybe that's that actually saying that, that that might explain why brendan's such you know is, is such a you know slobs on their knob so much the poor brothers because essentially they're doing the thing that he's doing with comedy right they've sort of like stepped they've kind of you know jumped over a few steps to progress their career they've kind of been able to perform on the biggest stage maybe without any sort of discernible talent um they've kind of you could use their fame and the attention they have and sort of you know funneled it through in different avenues to sort of bolster their message um maybe that's why he sort of kind of has some sort of affinity with them and they are quintessential california kids and if ever if ever there was a if ever there was a archetype for like the hollywood kid the kid in sort of living in california trying to make it in the same industry they're the archetypes of it right Yes, they've sort of done it on their own. They don't really need the industry. I guess that's a great thing. They're sort of like self-made in that regard. But how they approach things, how they go on, it's definitely something that you would see Brendan doing in the future. So that might explain it going forward. But still, um, I'd love to see Michael Bisping fight Jake Paul. That would be a pleasure. Again, Dylan Dennis was, would still be a good fight, but I still think there'll be a lot of excuses being made if he ends up losing. Blah, 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 blah. But I think the Jake, the Jake Paul and Michael Bisping, again, would set a precedent and just let people know that, hey, there are levels to this stuff. And even somebody that's 40 plus year old and has got one eye and suffered loads of, loads of injuries can still wash a guy that you think is tough. Because I think there's a quote out at the moment that's been... Um, attributed to Joe Rogan where he essentially says the poor brothers are really tough and he rates them and all this sort of shit but yeah you can be as tough as you want but when it comes to facing the top tier talent in the UFC there should be a gap there should be a discernible gap in skill set because if people even say it about Bellator right they say that the roster at Bellator is far less it's far weaker than the guys at um, UFC 
if that's the case, then come on. What, what do UFC people have to really fear when they're facing against the Paul brothers? Maybe there might be something about the occasion getting to them, right? Fighting on that sort of platform with all the media attention. Especially if you're Dylan Dennis, right? You're, you're, you're not really that well known outside of the jiu-jitsu world, apart from maybe you're associated with Conor McGregor. So there could be something about, hey, when you get on the big stage of stage fright. But I still think if you're that skilled as those guys are, there must be the grooves embedded in your head in terms of how you flow in a fight and how you hit and the combinations and the, the kind of feints, whatever you do, they're so ingrained in you. They come second nature. You might have a couple of minutes where you're sort of, you know, caught under the lights, but then you, you probably shake it out pretty quickly and just go into autopilot and start absolutely smashing guys' faces and you would hope so. Um, but again, waste of time, I think, going forward. I do think the sport boxing should focus on other things, but if it doesn't need to happen, please put it in the realm of somebody like a bit like imagine if these guys fought like a yo romero right guys like what 44 46 recently released by the ufc signed to bellator let him fight those kind of guys you know um that would be a real good way to sort of you know get an idea as to where the levels actually are in this thing that we call fighting but hey what do i know let's move on here what else do we have oof, oof, oof. we have probably one of my favorite sneakers just as we end the year actually because you know, it's my favorite model in general and i actually love what kiff doing i think you know they probably get a bit of an unfair reputation and i think maybe it has a lot to do with maybe because he doesn't even talk that much ronnie fake but i guess because of how he goes on he sort of probably there's maybe something about ronnie fake that makes people re he kind of maybe reminds people of because ronnie yeah ronnie fake looks like he would sound or kind of act the way that Joe LaPuma acts. You know, from com from complex sneaker shopping. Uh, Joe LaPuma has that corny, sort of like, you know, sneaker heady, up his own ass, gets everything for free, kind of like schmarmy thing about him, right? That no one really kind of vibes with what I don't, you know, the fucking thing with the hands, the stupid outfits that he wears, like, you know, monochrome, everything, and some loud trainers, unlaced, like, yeah, whatever, we don't care. Um, always kind of recounting stories of old times and when he used to get stuff for free like you know we don't really give a shit right everything in your wardrobe is tier zero it doesn't matter but regardless but Ronnie Fake seems to be like a real fan of the shit right he seems to really love streetwear he seems to really love sneakers he seems to take a lot of joy out of collaborations he goes you know when he collabs again maybe the collabs are a bit over the top right coca-cola this and that i think he doesn't say no to a collab it seems like but i do like that he's been given the ability to do stuff with a6 new balance nike right he doesn't necessarily have an exclusivity deal which kind of i love it sort of reminds me of my idol and somebody i look up to in terms of hiroshi fujiwara and how he approaches stuff right that kind of old school um, I would say the kind of the archetype of what an influencer should be, right? You're kind of objective and you just, you know, you're after great things that kind of fit your lifestyle and things that you sort of want, you love and you want to promote. And it's not necessarily about who offers you the bag, right? It's about stuff that you actually like and enjoy and you want to just spread the love and you want to kind of just amplify that message and i think Roddy fake does that as well his collaboration especially the bmw stuff again it was naff it was pretty stupid i thought i think wearing bmw merch when you can't drive or you don't own a bmw is ridiculous beyond belief but i do understand that these brands in some sectors have kind of eclipsed the automotive sector and of course turned into lifestyle brands that people are kind of adopting in normal life but i do think you know wearing a supreme lamborghini top and you don't own one is insane maybe Lamborghini makes more sense because it's, it's so far out of pe most people's um, buying a bracket, whatever, that it makes more sense. It's sort of like an aspirational thing. Um, but I still think, you know, I would never wear a Rolex hoodie, right? Just not going to happen. Why would I wear that? It makes no sense. Um, so maybe the collaborations are a little bit excessive, but I still think each one, you can definitely see an appreciation and a love for the products that he's basically interacting with and a brand he's working with too. Which brings us nicely onto the latest one, which is Kif Nike Air Force One New York, right? Um, easily one of my favorite sneakers to come out of the year. Um, not too loud, not too crazy, but just expertly done and a pers a perfect representation of why Air Force Ones are one of my quintessential favorites. Um, you know, in London, of course, Air Force Ones are you know maybe one of the most popular shoes being worn. I remember there was a report made about house bur burglaries or something along those kind of lines in inner city areas and the trademarks left in gardens and places and most of the shoes that were being used were like air force ones air max 95s um I, think, I forgot the other one something else right but air force ones are very popular here especially worn with like tech track suits and shit people love them but i just love the fact that in terms of paneling 
there's just no way that you can fuck up the colorway. That's what I love about Air Force Ones, right? You've got the, the of course, the forefoot, the mid, and the back area. Like the blockage is really well laid out um, in terms of colorways, and of course, the swoosh and the change you can do to the sole. But it's just impossible to get a colorway wrong on Air Force One. Of course, some of the other things that they do later on, where they sort of, you know, uh, winterize it, they add these little bells and whistles onto it. But if you just kind of a you know take the actual silhouette itself and just try and amplify it that you know you come up with these incredible iterations like they've done here um with kiff where they've got this luxurious translucent sole um they've got these sort of uh patent-esque swoosh on the side that sort of disappear um and fade out into white as they hit back into the um heel tab and then they've got the nyc logo embedded on the heel which is great and it reminds me that i think there was a pair of apples from mids that i had prior that i used to get a foot locker they used to do that quite often they just sell mids and um, low tops with the nyc puerto rican flag mexican flag whatever random ones but they've stopped that so much so which is annoying there was there used to be a really good market for gr air force ones even gd sports you do used to do a pretty decent pairs but now the you know the ones that they make and sell in those shops are usually very poor quality but um so you have to wait you know and, or maybe get a pair from like you know japan where they sort of do really great colorways in air force ones but i think this is easily one of the best to come out in a very long time and the fact that they've got contrasting swoosh on either side you've got a red and a blue there on either side you've got the tone or tongue which i love too that detail on collaborations which they don't normally happen but i think nowadays i'm not sure why i think the sneaker brands have finally accepted that these collaborations do a lot more for them than they would than they probably do on their own so they do allow them a bit more customization options i don't like the fact that they didn't lace them properly that's always a bugbear with me you can't have a product shot and not lace shoes like even working in retail right you'd get absolutely ripped to pieces if you put a shoe out on display that looked like this like you just had to relace it it's just a part of the parts of the job um you know it just the fact that they look good sans the lacing kind of helps but it would be a lot you know the, the the actual effect of the shoe can kind of be heightened by how you style it and as i show you in the shoe later with dipset you'll definitely see that but again i love the fact that they give them the option to kind of customize the tongue um of course kind of give, give them a stamp there going forward um the leather looks somewhat tumbled so it's definitely a nice um quality leather i love that the seams have been sealed or kind of you know tucked in which kind of again lends itself to usually the more premium level of air force ones and just in general the icy clear sole the bottom just absolutely beautiful man easily one of my favorite shoes this year to come out again that's even said of all the other bells and whistles shoes that have come out because again you know air force ones are probably my top five shoes in terms of air force one jordan fours uh mx 90s top three yeah i say top three shoes overall obviously dr martin's and what else do I wear day to day? And maybe let's say uh, Vans old school, right? Those are the things I probably would wear day to day in terms of whatever. But in terms of top three Nike shoes, for sure, Air Force One, MX 1995 are definitely um, within my top three there. But yeah, this is an article to the following. Um, though Kiff's retail and brand empire has uh, touched down in cities as diverse as Tokyo and Los Angeles, its roots are deepest in New York City. An ethos that is, that is uh, fully on display in the brand's unveiling of their co created Nike um, and SYC, the New York Knicks collaboration. Okay, it's New York Knicks collaboration. Okay, makes sense. That's why the colorway is there. And the standard pieces collection and off teased centric New York One Air Force One low. Previewed through 2020, the shoe is set to release before the year draws a close ahead of its official arrival detail images enable a deep dive into the dashing design officially dubbed the white rush white rush blue brilliant orange okay it's orange or red sorry um this air force one upper is composed of crisp white leather and bursts an og style shape with thick heel padding um signature details are served up by an orange lateral swooshes and bright blue medial swooshes apart from their alternating color these uh brand hits are made of glossy plastic material and face like towards the hill Nike Sportswear is familiar with the NYC swoosh graphic is present and accounted for on each lateral hill and a trifecta of the of the Kif branded hits uh, rounds off at the top half the hybrid Kif Air establishment embroidered on the orange on the hill oh is it Kif Air I didn't see that is it got that Kif on the hill where did I see that oh okay so obviously oh wow I didn't see that that's great little detail isn't it lovely look at that they really gave them every sort of uh, license to 
make this look great so the um, nike air force one kif are coming out on december 18th uh, 130 dollars and of course to make them even more appealing they decided to do a shoot with legendary new york city rap group dipset one of my favorite groups of all time um containing two of my favorite mcs of all time in jim jones and cameron and um yeah man it just looks even better it just looks even bloody better the tracksuit that cam's got on is flipping great um trap favorite is, is the one jim's got on i love too i'm not really in love with the navy that joe santana has on but it's just good to see him in general looking healthy but just look how great these shoes look when they've been actually you know f kind of swagged out let's say with an outfit and again they haven't relaced the shoes which again is a pet peeve but maybe it's just me that does that no one else does this do they but they release their shoes to make them sure it's over and under and it's not laced the way they are but ugh, how good does this stuff look man like again it's a bit it's a bit um it's a bit geeshy right it's a little bit too out there maybe the other branding but phew, i love it i think cameron's got to a kiff beanie on as well maybe it's part of the collaboration I'm not liking the fact that he's got that. It looks like he's got a bit of a, he's got a bit of do -do. what's that thing? That hair dye thing on his beard, isn't it? The beard looks a little bit artificial, but you know, Cam's my guy, so I'll let him off on that one. But just look how good these look on feet. And you can tell that they've got great leather and they've kind of messed around maybe with the tooling because usually on the shitter quality um, Air Force Ones, whenever your foot goes in on them, and again, I've got a fat foot, so I know usually you're kind of, the outside of your foot sort of bleeds or you know leans out onto the side i don't know why usually i don't know what it sort of crumbles on that side but the better quality ones usually have a little bit more structure and sturdiness in them in the middle it might be because of the actual quality of the leather but regardless you can definitely tell there's a less warping here i think normal pairs when you see them there's more warping on the swoosh just because the leather is a bit shit continue here you've got of course them in the center of the knicks stadium flossing again they look really good here they look even better there with Jewel stunning in them. Of course, Jim Mix. This track is probably one of my favorites. Maybe more so than the one that Cam's wearing. This looks incredible. So Kif, so Kif Nike and um, New York Knicks. And it's got the swoosh that kind of contrasts right across there. And then you've got Jim, of course, wearing them, making it look bad. They look so good, man. Oh, God. And of course, the hat is probably part of it as well. It just looks amazing. So I'm such a big fan of it, man. The whole collection looks absolutely banging. Um, what it says here, that's meant to come out as well on December 18th too. So definitely check out for those coming out very, very soon. But definitely one of my more favorite collabs that I've seen thus far. What else is going on here? Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. What else do I want to talk about? Many, many, many things. Is, okay, we've seen that. We've seen this. Hmm. Cool. Yep. There we go. Let's talk about that one. Boom, 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 boom. This is a bit of a difficult topic to kind of broach or to speak on, you know, with it being women's business and stuff. But um, this is an article from New York Times detailing uh, FTK Twig's account or detailing FA Quid regarding a lawsuit that she's filed against Shayla both concerning abusive relationship that she was a part of and again it's pretty it's a pretty tough read don't get me wrong um again i'm not really too familiar with fk twigs uh, music i've watched a couple of Shayla Buff's movies more importantly uh honey boy which probably lends itself to explaining a little bit of some of his actions towards women going forward um but again i think there are some bigger questions to be um asked about these kind of relationships especially in the entertainment industry just in general day to day life i think maybe the rationale that fk twigs has regarding her being um, wanting to speak out because she wants women to know that even someone like herself who is successful, rich and has, you know, a good group of friends around her can also be caught in a situation as it can help people. I don't necessarily think that is um, true. I think it's maybe a bit of a naive point. I don't think, you know, the regular everyday woman who's kind of suffering in silence would glean anything from this story apart from at least she knows it's not only her, but I don't think it kind of give will give them any sort of uh, comfort knowing that FK2 is getting abused. Um, it doesn't necessarily do anything it doesn't move the conversation forward but i do understand that you know with especially young people especially in hollywood especially just you know narcissistic a types um when they sort of meet people like this like shayla buff has been detailed in this example they're not necessarily the best match 
again it can be difficult i can imagine if you're some if you're like an alpha female like a fk twigs and you're super successful and doing your own thing it can be very difficult to date you know to do that subway so it does make more sense maybe to kind of date people within your industry who kind of get what you're doing but the trouble is you're both coming into it you know most of the time people that perform on that level that she is performing on and, and that he's doing his uh, there is usually a kind of burning desire or to kind of escape the tread of your everyday life or maybe just that you're kind of wanting to put out your emotional distress in some sort of artistic form right so you're carrying baggage you're carrying some level of trauma so to have two people who are suffering from those two things in one place trying to you know pursue a career it just seems it just doesn't seem a uh, tenable it doesn't seem like the right solution doesn't seem like the right combination of people again like i said i appreciate she can't date subway dude but there definitely has to be a um a conversation around uh how maybe some young ladies maybe enable this sort of behavior because i do think a lot of these dudes um like shayla buff have a usually a track record of being absolute dickheads to most of the women in their lives with the exception of what of their mothers maybe and i do think sometimes there can be this little thing nagging temptation in a woman's mind to be like oh i'm gonna be the one to change him i'm gonna be the one to set him right i'm gonna be the one to fix him and i just think that is a bit naive i just think people that are kind of you know made the way Shayla Buff is and who have gone through the things that he has gone through will just inevitably always have this sort of switch in them and it's whether or not you can um, tolerate that if you're a woman or um, whether or not you accept that whether or not you think your love deserves that sort of um, response whether or not that's a sort of love language actually that you want to um, partake in any way shape or form but anyway let's regard let's actually read the article and we can dive a bit more deep into it so it says here this is fk twig sues shia labeouf citing relentless abusive relationship written by katie benner and melanie rizik um it says the following just after valentine's day in 2012 sorry 2019 the musician fk twigs was in a car speeding towards los angeles at the wheel was her boyfriend the actor shia labeouf he was driving recklessly she said in a lawsuit filed on friday removing his seatbelt and threatening to crash unless she professed her love for him already warning signs they were returning from a de from the desert where the birth the star of transformers had raged at her throughout the trip fk twig said in a lawsuit once waking up in the middle of the night choking her after she begged to be let out of the car she said he pulled over at the gas station she took her bag from the trunk but miss libra followed and assaulted her throwing her against the car while screaming in her face according to the suit he then forced her back in the car the gas station incident is at the heart of the lawsuit that Mr. LeBeouf, 34, abused FK Twigs physically, emotionally and mentally many times in a relationship that lasted just short of a year. Her aim in coming forward, she said in an interview, was to explain how even critically acclaimed artists with money, home and a strong network of support can be caught in such a cycle. She says, I'd like to be able to raise awareness on the tactics that abusers use to control you and take you away from your agency, FK Twigs, born to Leela Deborah Barnett said. Mr. LeBeouf responded on Thursday to the concerns raised by Mrs. Barnett and, and the second former girlfriend who was accused him of abusive behavior in an email that broadly addressed his conduct. Um, he said, I'm not in any position to tell anyone how my behavior made them feel. The New York Times said, he said in the New York Times, I have no excuses for my alcoholism, my aggression, only rationalization. Um, I have been abusive to myself and everyone around me for years. I have a history of hurting people closest to me. I'm ashamed of the history and I'm sorry for those I hurt. There is nothing else I can really say, which is a pretty decent response, I guess, from somebody who obviously knows that they are bang, you know, they've got bang to rights. They've got, you know, they've been caught red handed. They've been called out on their shit. Finally, they have to be accountable for the actions. And it definitely is in stark contrast to how a kind of Brian Callen approach this situation that he's in, right? That's kind of what kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. He kind of responded to the accusations of rape and, you know, um, sexual misconduct to, you know, attributing it to council culture. It's like, no, this isn't council culture. This is people that have had intimate experiences with you who said that you kind of overstepped the mark on several occasions and they're calling you to rights to it especially in this area where people especially women feel like they have finally the platform because i think there was people were listening before but they weren't listening to the extent they're listening to now things definitely change now things definitely move in a better direction you don't get blacklisted that maybe you would have in the past if you're a woman it feels like there's more support group people are more understanding of or more willing to listen and accept your accept your position that you were in because i think maybe in the past people might have said oh you put yourself in that position you know sort of like um 
what they call it is it victim victim blaming sort of thing that they do online sometimes where there's you know that kind of adage of like oh she's wearing a short skirt she deserved it that sort of brain dead thinking but i think people are a bit more you know aware of the different f challenges that face different genders and different you know uh, sectors of the entertainment industry especially women more so it's just exploitive in its very nature just not even i guess it's not even gendered it's just ingrained in that industry because of you know you look at contracts you look at the way roles are doled out you look at positions of influence and power it's just it's just uh it's just rife for exploitation so it's no surprise that young impressionable women who don't really have any experience would essentially get taken for a ride um but again it's good that they have a platform now where they can sort of speak about it openly um again going back to this i just think I think part of the allure with somebody like a Shirley Booth, especially if you're a lady, has to be that he's this like rock star, crazy dude, right? Who sort of lives off the seat of his pants, um, immerses himself into roles and, you know, kind of uh, is kind of a, uh, a complete contrast to the, um, you know, the quintessential image of somebody you would imagine to be a Hollywood star. So there is definitely an aspect of a law that will kind of attract you to somebody like that. But again, I just think there are so many red flags or somebody like him. I'm sure his behavior and how he goes on and the fact that he's an A-list star, I don't think this is the first time because, you know, Muto's account that supposedly he choked her and shouted at her at a gas station. I'm sure there were witnesses that saw these sort of things, but I think at the level of celebrity that they're at, they can probably shush and silence people. Um, I think the fact that this is the first I've ever heard of him being abusive to women in the press in any certain extent especially when you consider the kind of person that he is if you've kind of watched honey boy you'll get a glimpse into how he's grown up and he's had a bit of a you know a hard upbringing this makes complete sense right this story does kind of marry up with the person that you saw he depicted himself as in the big screen but why haven't we heard about anything concerning Shia LaBeouf prior to this? Why are we only hearing this one story based on FK Twig's brave decision to sue him in court? Because there are people enabling him in the industry. That's the issue at hand. That's why sometimes I get a bit annoyed when, you know, again, I understand the victims, but when women always kind of attribute this to like a men v. women thing. It's more complicated. That It's more so a deep-seated um, corrupt, moral corruptness that kind of has, has kind of infested the entire industry, right? I look, I think of somebody like um harvey weinstein's personal assistant who somehow still maintains that she had no idea that this abuse was happening underneath her watch and it's just impossible to think of that right it's just impossible to believe that a monster such as harvey weinstein was able to separate his debauched acts that he did to young aspiring actresses as they come up in the scene and for his closest assistant to not have seen anything that have occurred it's just not possible to it to happen there has to have been enablers around him that let these things happen and again when you read the accounts um, from various women there are different people at various stages of the process before you get to Harvey Weinstein that would have known exactly what he was trying to get out of these women who didn't raise the alarm who didn't warn them beforehand and those are the people who are probably as much to blame as the actual um, aggressor um, themselves so there's definitely some questions that need to be said like why didn't we hear about these stories by Sheriff Pryor why does it take um, a brave young lady's um, court case in order for us to start asking some questions about his conduct and how he goes on and how he's portrayed in movies and how he's sort of received in public in you know by critics and whatever it may be and it's just a really disappointing thing to see and like I said it goes to show that it's less about the men and the women and power dynamics and it's more so about the people behind the scenes who enable this behavior who are more worried about their job than doing the right thing and speaking truth and kind of highlighting abusers they just want to maintain their position it's just a very insidious industry to begin with um it continues said the lawsuit filed in los angeles Super, um, superior court says that mr leboeuf knowingly gave miss barnett a sexually transmitted disease it accuses him of relentless abuse including sexual battery assault and infliction of emotional distress flipping hell um, mr leboeuf his representative did not immediately respond to the request to comment on the lawsuit like it's interesting too considering that he's such a style icon on instagram that like he's like the um he's like the fit version or like the cooler version of a jonah hill right people seem to kind of um uh, adorn this style god status on him so much so that i think i remember kanye tweeting that he wanted him to model for his easy line but he didn't turn up for the fitting or something but there are pages and pages on instagram dedicated to his style where he wears like running shorts and you know army boots and shit and looks like he just you know crawled himself out of an ashtray but I wonder how they're going to sort of approach this sort of news. They just continue posting his fits or do they address the situation or do they close down their accounts? I wonder. 
it continues. Um, Carol Foe, a stylist who Carolyn, sorry, Carolyn Foe, I think you pronounce that, uh, who's another of Libus former girlfriends, described a similarly tumultuous experience to the Times. Some of which are so also outlined in a lawsuit. Once the suit says he drunkenly pinned her to a bed, head hard by her enough that she bled. Afterwards, she began to grapple with the idea that she was abusing her, that he was abusing her. So much goes into breaking down a man or woman to make them okay with a certain kind of treatment. She had an interview. That is always a really big warning sign in it whenever you read these stories whenever there's a pattern of behavior from different women um across various across different points of time it definitely goes to show that quite possibly the person that's been accused of the crime is definitely guilty you know this sort of headbutting of the thing the choking the whatever it may be the you know shouting whatever it may be the, those are still elements that you saw being repeated in um fk twigs account so it definitely if you're one of the uh, people's on the fence like oh we don't know there's not enough evidence is like mm, he sounds like a piece of shit to be fair it continues presented with a detailed account of the claims that the woman made against him in interviews and subsequently in lawsuit mr leboeuf responding in a separate email wrote that many of these allegations are not true he said um the opportunity to air their statements publicly and accept accountability for those things i've done he said a sober he's a member of the sober 12-step program so i'm guessing he's that that's part of the process reason why he was so abusive but again not an excuse he said i am not cured of my ptsd and alcoholism but i'm committed to doing what i need to do to recover and i'll forever be sorry for the people that i may have harmed on the way it's a good obviously explanation but it kind of feels a little bit like um is it kevin spacey when he got accused of um you know sexual assault by that star trek character guy i forgot his name star trek discovery actor and then he immediately came out and said i'm gay all right it's like that's not a way that you can't attract um the sort of accusations but i guess i guess he's doing the work in it behind the scenes 12-step program he's obviously going through therapy i'm assuming uh it continues here mr leboeuf has a long history of turbulent behavior he's been arrested several times on charges that have been dismissed including assault disorder it's getting this is this is a bit smarmy for the new york times why would they include um charges that have been dismissed just to what so, because it, it, those the accusations are this is where they lose me sometimes the accusations already are enough right he's a, like two people that he kind of was in a long-term relationship with are deciding to go to court right in order to sue him <clears throat> and i think fk twig said she's going to use the funds um to give back to you know certain women's groups and whatever it may be but for somebody that you're in a relationship with you know it's fair enough that you were in a toxic relationship and you both said and did bad things and you just want to move on but for fk twigs to kind of take the time out of her day to file charges in a court of law and for another girlfriend to also latch onto the back of that and file charges alongside it goes to show that he was probably a bit of a shithead um so there, that's what needs to be said you don't need to add this you know he has charges that have been dismissed say so why does that matter if they've been dismissed <clears throat> It continues in 2013 strangers recorded a video of him arguing with his girlfriend at the time the actress mia goff telling her this is the kind of thing that makes a person abusive jesus christ after the men recording mr buff gave him a ride he told them if i'd stayed there i would have killed her according to video oh, yeah i remember that one that he was super smashed in it um the continues said Ms. mr miss barnett said listen the would squeeze her and grab her by the point of bruising but she did not go to the police she said first out of misguided concern about harming his career and later because she thought her account would not be taken seriously as it would be futile mm, that's not true though and it come on a successful um rich attractive young lady who's been abused by somebody in hollywood it's always going to be a leading story people are always going to believe you um i don't think there's anyone that people would end, i don't think there's a man that the public would ever take the side of in this sort of a, a, um a example so i think this is a little bit you know self-flagellation of some sort it continues here though many states have laws that treat gender-based sexual domestic violence as civil rights and violation um tort suits of the kind miss barrett is pursuing with a daunting account of painful moments are relatively uncommon most of the allegations arise amid divorce or custody proceedings or while seeking uh, orders of protection but there has been a slight uptick in civil claims since the Me Too movement amid more attention on the complex nature of abuse such said um julie uh, goldsheed a law professor at cyu law school who studies gender violence and civil rights yeah that makes sense i would imagine a lot of women out there probably don't even know they're in a political relationship until they see it being spoken about in public right until they see stories of people being you know i don't know someone coming you know your, your partner coming in at night and pushing you around the bed or whatever whatever aggression that might be put towards you sometimes you just rationalize in your head especially when you're in love you rationalize the most insane things so there is an aspect of um benefit when these celebrities come out and say these things but i do think sometimes when they 
deem themselves to be more important than the issue at hand and say you know i just said in the beginning that she feels like you know this is a good way of women to know that someone like myself can be in situations doesn't really serve anyone i don't think um like, and then at the end i think this is the most important thing she said in the law where she says here she gives the bed da, 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 da. yeah she said um in the lawsuit miss barnett uh, said she plans to donate a significant portion of her monetary damages to domestic violence charities she said it was actually very expensive and a massive undertaking of time and resources to get out she said in an interview her status makes her a situation unusual she said and she wanted to share her story because it was otherwise uncommon so common she says what i went through with shia was the worst thing i've ever been through in my life and i don't think people would ever think that would happen to me hmm. but i think it's the thing that it can happen to anybody but again credit to her for going through with it credit to her for putting her face front and center credit because you know because I, I don't think anyone wants to be portrayed. as much as people say victimhood culture is a you know a scourge in society i don't think most people want to be labeled a victim i think most people would rather have let people have the illusion that they're strong independent women so for them to put themselves front and center with this sort of allegation it does take a level of courage and bravery um so definitely credit to her and again her kind of wanting to donate a significant portion of the pro of the proceedings or the winnings to charity again says a lot about her as a person as well you know in her moment of struggle and need she's still trying to look out for others so again credit to her and hopefully they reach a resolution going forward but again it'll be interesting to see what happens with Shia LaBeouf and his career what does occur because he's a bit of a media darling he's well liked in the industry he's obviously supremely talented you know in front and behind the camera what do they do he's a big cash cow um do they you know counsel him do they give him um, a timeout it'll be interesting to see how he gets treated compared to other people that have been accused of these things who have maybe had a bit more a bit more of a um adversarial relationship with the press or just haven't had the best reputation with media people because i've said it prior i think about jobs i've always been under the i've been under no illusion that most jobs for the most part you're not really judged on your skill or your level of proficiency you're more so judged on your ability to kind of connect with your co-workers and you know um you know have some sort of rapport with them so if that's the case then it's no surprise that the people that get cancelled the most are the ones that most people don't like anyway and they're just trying to find an excuse to get them out of the of the, of the scene and basically you know give their chance and position to somebody else that they kind of favor so it'll be interesting to see in this case <clears throat> with a shine above that people actually like what happens there do people still have the same energy or do they try and make excuses for him because they like him let me see what happens it'll be interesting to see how this story develops next on the list what else do we have here 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 um let's see you got that you got this you got that you got that we got this you got that we got that oh yeah this is a this is a funny one isn't it right so this is courtesy of yahoo news it's a couple of weeks old but i thought i'd cover it anyway but it's just definitely like you know uh LOL, LOL worthy news let's say that LOL worthy news right so courtesy of Yahoo News it says here Kanye West Sunday service choir seeks 1 million in unpaid wages did you hear that Kanye West Sunday service choir seeks 1 million in unpaid wages which is so LOL worthy considering <clears throat> the scandal that Chance the Rapper's got himself in with his ex-manager who's essentially suing him for um, damages and unpaid royalties on his album basically alleging that Chance didn't listen to him in terms of not releasing the big day and rushing the production of it blah 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 <clears throat> and I mentioned another podcast that <clears throat> Well, that maybe this explains why Chance the Rapper and Kanye West are such good friends because essentially they're the same person right um supremely narcissistic they you know they think their shit don't stink and they have a tendency to burn bridges to those around them and sort of you know surround themselves with yes men so that they can go about doing exactly what they do without having the um you know possibility of being called out or being pulled aside by their friends and it's even made more funny with this story with sunday service of kanye because there was a point in time where he was bragging in interviews about the amount of money that he spent out of his own pocket to keep running sunday service and make it a thing and you know i think they did what 52 no 32 weeks consecutively back to back and he said a lot of it came out of his own pocket it was not, wasn't the most profitable thing in the world flying a choir all around the, you know all around the us um you know in custom made outfits or whatever it may be but it's just hilarious that behind the scenes he actually hasn't been paying them but anyway let's continue it's story from yahoo it says the following 
Um, it says, um, the singers who backed West at the Hollywood Bowl a year ago are suing the rapper, producer, designer, and presidential hopeful. The choir had that performed the Kanye West at the Hollywood Bowl in November 2019. <clears throat> it's suing the rapper and producer and designer um, Kanye West <coughs> candidate for unpaid wages. Contract um, workers in the Sunday service complained that not about not receiving overtime pay following the event, which probably took two weeks to organize. <laughs> okay, sorry. They said they're supposedly demanding West is said to have authorized dozens of last minute changes that resulted in overtime for participants, which they allege has gone unpaid more than a year later. One year. So that's the one that they did after the fashion show, right? With um, Little Yatty and Leon Collin and stuff. So it continues. This suit is a second related West um, Nebuchadnezzar opera, which took place last year after the release of Jesus. Oh, okay. It's, it's that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar um, opera that he did which took place after the release of Jesus' King album a hairstylist alleged that she has not been paid for her overtime and of course she has filed for unpaid wages continuing wages and damages and civil penalties statutory penalties and authorities fees the interesting part of this is that I've gone through a similar thing with unpaid wages with you know um, Nicole Oliver bloody scam artist to say the least um from people that i owe that i used to work under before who kind of refused to pay us um, when the company went under and basically what happens usually is that for the most part the employees or the freelancers or the contractors you do try and reach a resolution directly with the person you try and resolve it as best as you can then when it can't be resolved you then have to go to the course but usually it's the last last step right no one wants to go to the course because it just takes too long to go through of course if you're if you're pushing a person for the money so obviously you need that money the last thing you want to do is kind of prolong the 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 process but if it goes more than a year it then becomes a point of principle you've probably found another situation for yourself you found other means to make sure you have food on the table and have a roof over your head so if you're still pushing this um you know unpaid wages thing it's mostly a thing of like no it's a principle of i need this to be concluded so that this person knows that you can't mess with people's money and i guess that says a lot about kanye considering that he's you know a multi-billionaire and he's now taken yeezy to you know the pinnacle of fashion and he's possessed he's essentially rid of himself of the debt that he was in earlier in his career and it's essentially gone from success after success to success he's you know he's gone he's gone to great lengths to keep reminding us of how much money he has and the fact that he's free to do and say whatever he wants you know he organized that you know that propaganda campaign thing that he did in Forbes where he essentially talked about his wealth openly and then went back and questioned the validity of the paper the article and blah blah blah, blah. but he doesn't stop to mention he, he always finds a chance to mention to us the amount of wealth that he's acquired over his time which you know is his right to do so because you know acquiring wealth at that level is an easy thing to do but it's also ironic that the same person that keeps reminding us how rich they are is also the same person that doesn't do right by the people that he hires to work with him especially a choir you know under the framework of being a christian man not paying a choir um what they what they owed in unpaid wages is really diabolical it continues the Blast reportedly obtained the court documents which list the group of workers on a musical production as a plaintiffs. The unnamed hair staffer is leading the suit and claims that West and Live Nation failed to properly compensate the hair assistant and many dozens of other persons who've performed services on the production, including the background actors and performance audience members. Now again, this is a story as old as time. Loads of people connected with Live Nation, not loads of people connected with Yeezy and um, connected with Kanye have, you know, not been paid what they've been paid, not been paid what they're supposed to be paid. Or just in general haven't paid in general um this is a standard thing which is really a bad um image for Kanye going forward it says here the group is reportedly also taking issue with the way that the defendants oversaw controlled and ran the production and the aggrieved employees worked many hours in the production and were not entirely paid for their work of course Kanye started his um, Sunday service events in January 2019 the event started as a one-hour session at his home or rehearsal spaces with West an active choir and musicians performing worship and non-traditional gospel songs in stand expanded to performing across the country stadiums of shows have even performed at Joe in Houston the Sunday service choir did back up West um for his Jesus King album released in last November, then debuted their own subsequent release. The West led Jesus is born on Christmas Day two months later. But just it's just funny in it, the irony of it, it? The one of the richest men in the world, um, one of the richest men in hip hop, the first billionaire in the you know, first billionaire was Jay Z, right? I think he was maybe second, is now, you know, unable to pay his choir that he hired to work overtime during the release of his opera it's just it's just poetic you know it really is poetic like what, what can you say what can you say 
Okay, what else do we have here? What else do we have here? Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Let's go to this one. But, but, but. Yeah, let's, let's finish this one. So, we finally have a conclusion regarding Nike and Warren Lotus. They've reached a confidential um, settlement regarding uh, the lawsuit. Of course, Nike was suing Rowan, Warren Lotus for putting together these bullshit ass um, Nike dunks that he was um, selling um, as some sort of edit and custom and homage to you know the iconic pigeon dunk. And for some odd reason, Jeff Staple decided to uh, co-sign it and down the hill with Warren Lotus, which eventually led to his excommunication from Nike, which has been greatly received for myself. Which I because I think he's an untalented hack who's been you know riding the back of the pigeon dunk success for the best part of 10 plus years he has no new original ideas he's not a core innovative thinker and he's just somebody who has effectively been able to game the system because he's older than everyone right just because you hang around longer and you're around in the scene doesn't mean essentially that you actually know what you're talking about in my opinion so this is an article here from Complex. It says, Nike v. Warren Lotus legal battle appears to reach a confidential settlement uh, written by Brendan Dune. It says the following, Nike's trademark infringement lawsuit against Los Angeles-based designer, designer, ha, Warren Lotus appears to have reached a confidential settlement agreement according to a court documents filed on Friday. The lawsuit filed in the Central Court of California in October accused Lotus of selling illegal fakes of Nike's iconic dunk sneakers. In the unsigned final judgment, the court um, upheld the Nike trademark around the shoe as enforceable all the loaders to refrain from selling the range of products that he made to look like nikes and he didn't make them what he did is that he he bought he bought um he he went out and sourced a factory because i guess they're not available just yet but there's a there were factories in the background who are now making um you know um dead stock nike dunk sbs right uh, basically fakes and he basically reached out to a factory and got them to remake the pigeon dunk, which is one of the most coveted dunks out there, maybe alongside the night, the, maybe the London dunk. Um, and he basically wanted to get them redone by this factory and then slap his logo on the side. But the way he sold it to his customers or to the public in general was that he was building or retooling from the ground up a Nike pigeon dunk that he bought himself from his own collection at an Italian factory somewhere with the premium, premium quality materials as a sort of, reminder as of the quality that nike once had and also basically as a middle finger back up to the brand right which again i'm not really sold on i think it's a bullshit excuse you know the same way how i don't think you know i think maybe the the shoe surgeon has probably more talent in his left toe and he does the same thing again and again right python and lizard print leather on jordans whatever they may be but he actually the de um disassembles a shoe takes it apart um you know re redesigns the panels and builds it from the ground up right and kind of redoes the whole thing um from scratch so this guy just buying fakes and slapping his logo on the side isn't what he sold so he immediately misled the customers that were even purchasing his thing and he didn't have them to stock right they weren't even to hand he just took loads of pre-orders and pocketed most of the money and then i've guess spent maybe 20 percent of it if that on the shoes in china so it was a complete horror of a situation the fact that he thought he could get away with it was just insane but anyway he continues a spokesperson for lotus confirms with complex today that the lawsuit has been resolved through a settlement declined to comment further i wonder how much he had to pay Nike did not respond to a request to comment either that's the original pair there i guess signed by jeff sable himself the same shoe he's been he's been riding the shoe for the to the dirt don't get me wrong good colorway good idea but the amount of times he tells the story of the cues and the fights and the police like shut the fuck up man untalented hack but it continues um the the lotus dunk lookalike sneaker that gained popularity and notoriety in the last year was a significant source of venture of revenue sorry for the designer who sold over 10 million dollars worth of them right pre-sale but no one's even i don't think no one's even got a pair yet from what i have understood um it's all just you know hypothetical i think he was selling them for like 300 dollars each 10 million pounds worth it's just insane um the shoes copied let's say how many do you sell pairs if you're selling for 300 dollars because my my uh maths is terrible uh 300 times what 100 you sell 100 pairs nope um 300 times uh, 500 pairs nope 300 times how many shoes do you sell to get 10 million do you, do you sell a million of these shoes or do you sell 250,000 let's see if it's 250,000 uh let's see times 250 do you sell that that might make more sense god damn it yeah most probably something on those kind of lines right uh no let's see hundred thousand probably in it 300 times one hundred thousand. is that how many you sold 
Yeah, probably around that mark, or maybe just a bit under, maybe fifty thousand. Right, let's do that. Fifty thousand. My maths again isn't good. So three hundred times what was that ten thousand? No, ten thousand. Yeah, ten thousand. Or one hundred thousand. Yes, he sold maybe maybe. <sighs> That's insane. That's insane the amount of shoes he sold. <laughs> Again, I haven't worked it out, so don't don't laugh. But anyway, continues. <laughs> After Nike sued from this fall, Lotus tried to give customers who pre-ordered his recent shoes a replacement in the form of a new shoe called the Reaper, which was even worse, right? He's defended this right to distribute the sneaker, which looks significantly less like a dunk, but still shares the overall shape of the Nike shoe. The proposed uh, permanent injunction on the Lotus case bars him from selling a host of Nike S items, but the Reaper shoe is not among them. So he's been able to get away with selling this absolute dog shit shoe that he's selling called the Reaper, which looks fucking horrendous. It looks like something that you would have bought in Dawson Market, right? It's just terrible for someone that equates himself to be a designer that that looks legitimately bad like all the way bad and again it's a photoshop like he's he's pocketed 10 million dollars right of pre-sale and he can't even be bothered to make something just from like a local factory somewhere just to kind of get it specced up so people can see what it looks like and so he can basically sell that story of him being a designer and kind of crafting them from the ground up from an Italian factory that would go a long way in terms of kind of legitimizing his design credentials why don't you make one of these shoes yourself right why don't you make them by hand and see how difficult it is to make because again he's not creative he doesn't have any original ideas just copies what brands have ever done just slaps his logo on the side but again he could earn a lot of goodwill a lot of kind of understanding as a designer for you to go out and actually make it like if you zoom in here you probably still see this nike swoosh on the tongue in it i bet you right if you zoom in you can't zoom in any further but i bet there's still a nike swoosh here somewhere you could definitely still see but look at that look how shit that looks it's a fucking photoshop it's a fucking photoshop you can see all the blemishes and smudges all over it i know a photoshop when i see one so ugh. But again, lucky that he's been able to do that. And for the customers, I guess it's good if you bought a pair. If you bought a pair of shoes from him, then you probably deserve to get scammed, in my opinion. But hey, um, he's defended his right to distribute them. Da, 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 da. Lotus indicated that he will continue to sell the Reaper shoe in an Instagram post on Friday, showing an upcoming clean slate color. Of course he will. What else has he got to do? He can, it's the only thing he can do, isn't it? Um, I plan to walk you through the process of making these shoes. So there's a complete transparency and goes in his pair. Okay, so he's going to show us the the chat. The, 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 the Fang Zhu factory he goes to make them in. Says, yeah, Nike confirms the complex a lawsuit is resolved by our sentiment with designer. But again, an absolutely uh, disastrous end, you know, maybe a beneficial end for myself because I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of Jeff Staple. So Jeff Staple loses his Nike contact. Warren Lotus gets called out and gets exposed as a charlatan of a designer that he is. And in general, we keep on moving. So good to see that conclusion being reached. I wonder how much he has to pay in order to kind of reach a settlement. Do you have to, is that what you do when you reach a settlement? Someone sues you, right? You probably pay the person that's suing you probably to kind of make sure this goes away or you maybe commit to burning stuff. I don't know what happened, but regardless, glad to see that has been resolved in some way going forward what else we have here da, 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 da. oh this is from um courtesy of this um account called streetwear nightlife right which i'm starting to follow which is a pretty good little account and they're basically highlighting the recently designed um louis vuitton and Lucian Clark skate shoes that I put together, which I've never been a fan of, kind of. I don't know why it triggered me so much. I guess because of the Palace Association and skateboarding generally, you can have people were so, so it just kind of got me angry. But it's just it's another example of just how weird and irrational and sort of like group thinking and clicky the streetwear scene is in general. And it just always kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. Come when I was coming up, right? And I, again, I was one of the um, well, yeah, to forget what I was wondering. When I, when I was coming up and I was trying to get involved and I was trying to, you know, um, be a part of the skateboarding scene here in London, it was such a ball ache, right? They made my life such a living nightmare, right? Like the guys in, you know, the, the I forgot his name, is it Jake? The dude at Slam City who always has a, you know, the little short guy who had like a bummy, he was like kind of a moody face. Um, There's a few other people. The only guy who was called to me was, I forgot his name, is it Pullman? He was quite nice, but in general, that whole Slam City crew guys were just, went out their way to make me feel like an outsider when I first went in there. You know, and then, you know, taking part in forums and understanding the culture a bit more with a bit more experience i was led to believe i was come to the conclusion that it wasn't just me it was just like a general skate community hazing thing they do right to make sure they um uh to make sure that they kind of know who's coming in for the right reason so and so right it's a kind of self-protection mechanism which i respect i think some is think it's 
with the with it being the last true subculture i think they do need to have some safeguards in place to ensure people don't just come and it's supposedly exploit them i think they did the same thing with nike sb back in the day right there was a lot of um, negative reaction to nike when they first introduced the skateboarding line and then of course over time now most skate shoes are, ironically are being kept alive by nike sb but again that's the story for another day it was a horrible situation, right, to go through. But I eventually did, um, you know, befriend some of the people in the scene. I was kind of accepted in some way, shape or form, you know, and it, and it felt good to finally get through. I'm not going to lie. And, you know, like these people go to skate bars, hang out with people, go and see premieres of things, you know, whatever it may be. I, 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 did, the, I, I did the damn thing. But I did see a lot of hypocrisy in the scene in terms of how people approach certain things, right? I would see a lot of people on forums slap, you know, sidewalk back in the day, scoffing at stuff that, you know, maybe a Paul Rodriguez and Nigel Houston did, right? And how they kind of approached um, skateboarding as a sport, as a business. And it rubbed those guys up the wrong way, evidently. But then when it was somebody that they liked in the scene who they kind of felt as if was one of them, who was a, you know, who was a skate rat or whatever it may be, they would then excuse, make every excuse under the sun to justify why what they were doing made complete sense. And this is why I feel like with this Louis Vuitton and Lucian class skate shoe, Louis Vuitton making a skate shoe is absolutely insane, right? It goes against everything what skate shoes should be, right? They should be durable, non-expensive shoes that you can wear um, when you're skateboarding, essentially. And for Louis Vuitton to get involved and to kind of co-op skateboarding culture kind of goes against everything that it probably stands for. It kind of makes you laugh when you think about the negative reaction that the skateboarding community had when skate when Pharrell tried to get involved with obviously with his billion uh, billionaire boys club um, skate team. It also makes you laugh. Uh, just in general the uh, the kind of outrage i saw online when um well, what brand was that was that ken's i've got that brand that made like an easy es dsd free kind of orisis sort of copy of the lamb valve skate shoe people had a lot of things to say about that but then louis vuitton comes out makes a skate shoe and kind of you know lines it up with the collaboration with lucian and suddenly now it becomes a okay thing to do and my reply to that would be if this was Nigel Houston making this skate shoe with Louis Vuitton, or if this was Nigel Houston making this skate shoe with Burberry, people would be up in arms, especially the fact that supposedly this shoe is going to be retailing for $1,000, supposedly, 1200 in the comments. I think this is a comment here from um, Streetwear News, Streetwear Night Live. It says the following, while i really do enjoy lv's new skate shoe i can't help but think about the reality of this release is a 500 plus price tag right for a skate shoe will skate is actually skate these and will skate shoes pivot to mainstream wear and of course they have they've sort of sold their soul eventually um overall and it's a really sad state of affairs and again it just goes to show just how hypocritical these numb nuts are especially when i think about you know some of the donuts that associate with the kind of palace skateboard crew and those kind of dudes right i was one of the first people to buy a one of their t-shirts when they first launched and whatever and i had one bad negative experience an interaction with a couple of people that run the brand and ever since then i've kind of vowed never to wear this stuff again it was kind of based off the same thing i kind of got vibed out they thought i was a poser i don't know it was just like stupidness and again I, just because i hadn't been in their purview i'm not been around them they kind of felt i wasn't really true to the scene and now they're sort of whoring themselves left right and center to vogue to this to that to louis vuitton and just putting themselves in front front and center and they've kind of of abandoned whatever roots that they had in skateboarding and sort of turned themselves into like a quasi fashion label and again you excuse this sort of nonsense because it makes a big bucks and it's part of the current mainstream culture it's just disappointing to see there should be a lot more uproar against it but again because Lucian is well liked and because Louis, Louis, um, Louis Vuitton I guess with Virgil is well liked maybe the Louis Vuitton thing I think most of the Lucian thing makes more sense because it's a head and people get it and whatever it may be but this is diabolical like skate shoes should never be more than a hundred dollars at tops and for the fact that a, a, a fashion brand can come in and immediately sort of like you know leapfrog brands and place itself front and center and justify this shoe in any sort of meaningful way is really really wild and again goes to show that these motherfuckers are hypocrites into the highest extreme um, again, just imagine paying a thousand dollars to to for a skate shoe that you're meant to skate in it's just utterly 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 insane but you know not for me wouldn't seem wouldn't be seen wearing palace or any of these nonsenses in a you know any way shape or form but yeah what can you do what can you do okay that's it that is the excellent signature episode number 413 thanks so much for tuning in as per you it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's the first time tuning into the show of your youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below and of course if you're listening via the podcast please leave me a five star review and share the show with your family and friends until next time take care be safe peace